All right, welcome to another episode of KB Talks Podcast. I'm your host, KB. Here we are at the Jefferson Street Sound Museum. I'm going to be talking with my next guest, Lorenzo Washington. He started this museum 10 years ago and has a lot of information on all the musical artists that came to Nashville, especially Jefferson Street back in the day. Hope you guys enjoy it. Watch it. Like I said, another episode of KB Talks Podcast. Thank you. All right, welcome to another episode of KB Talks Podcast. I'm your host, KB. I got my next guest, Mr. Lorenzo Washington. How are you doing today, sir? Doing fine, Kendall. How are you, I'm sir? I'm doing good. Today, we're going to go a little bit more in-depth about the musical history that Nashville has. Um, and you're the right guy I've heard around the city to come to, so we got you here. So we're going to start back um, about your background a little bit. Where were you born? I was born here in Nashville, matter of fact, in East Nashville, across the Jefferson Street Bridge. Okay. And uh, on Wichita Street. Gotcha. Um, we moved from Wichita, um, I think I was about uh, 12, 13 years old. Okay. How about, was Nashville back then for you growing up? Uh, Nashville back then was pretty, it was a segregated uh, community. Okay. You know, that says a lot within itself. And um, uh, we had it kind of rough. We were called, um, I remember working at a service station called uh, Hoover's uh, Amoco Service Station. Mm -hmm. And uh, the son, the old man Hoover, was a really nice guy. He was a good guy. Gave us all in the neighborhood a chance to work and make a little money. We, I started off making 50 cents a night, worked three hours a night <laughs> for 150 cents. But that 50 cents was so important to us because I had three brothers and we all three had to have, all four had to have lunch money out of that 150 cents. So I was a breadwinner early on in life. All right, you made it work. That's yeah. good, that's good to hear. Um, what were some of your hobbies or favorite things to do while growing up here in Nashville? Oh, hobbies, you know, we didn't, coming out of the hoods that we came out of, we didn't have a lot of hobbies. We liked to skate. Mm -hmm. uh, we liked to, um, uh, back then, ride horses, because one of my neighbors had horses, and we could do a little uh, horseback riding down in the fields. Um, it wasn't a whole lot that uh, that we could do, right. you know, ride bicycles, uh, uh, run the uh, chickens, and just normal kid stuff, pretty much. Normal kid stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, um, where did your inspiration and love for music come from? Well, my first love for music came from listening to music uh, in my aunt's house. My aunt. He had a good time house, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the head she had uh, Victrolas in there, mm -hmm. and you could uh, play the music in the Victrolas. You know, it cost a nickel for per song, but uh, on the weekends there were a lot of folk coming in there and playing uh, uh, playing the Victrola. So that was the beginning of it, you know. Uh, and then we worked on up to where to the point that I was. Um, 16, 17 years old, and my best friend, Herbert Hunter, and he's on the wall up there. Okay. Uh, Herbert uh, was a singer, and he came to Jefferson Street at the age of 16, and being that we were raised up together from the age of about six, uh, I came with him when he came to Jefferson Street to, got, to try to get a record deal, mm. and by the age of 17, he did get a record deal with uh, Ted Jarrett. Okay. And he got a, a had two or three songs on the radio. So back then, you get a song on the radio, you were a popular cat. You oh, know, he was doing something big back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, to your to your knowledge, how was the musical scene in Nashville growing up in your eyes while you were growing up? Well, it was great. You know, uh, what made it so great was that we had all of these uh, clubs and beer joints and after hour joints all up and down Jefferson Street from 2nd Avenue all the way up to uh, 33rd Avenue, Price's Dinner Club on 33rd. Mm -hmm. So we, it was something going on all up and down Jefferson Street night and day. It's on the weekends from Thursday uh, till Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Right. So that gave a lot of opportunities for artists, you know, whether they were new, in the middle of their career, or have been already established to kind of still be able to play and gather crowds around 
um, to hear their music. So that's yeah. that's pretty good. Um, just to have availability, because now nowadays you have a lot of people probably fighting over one building to perform in. Exactly. But if you got multiple clubs and bars where you know it's everybody can be in each one and gather their own crowd, that, right. that can pay off a lot of dividends. Um, to your knowledge, what were some of the popular musicians? that performed in Nashville back in your day that you can remember that would stand out to people? Uh, local folk, you had Otis Redding here. Uh, you had uh, Clifford Curry here. You had uh, Marion James here. You had uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix here. You had uh, uh, Jimmy Church. Uh, you had um, um, Billy Cox who played bass guitar for Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a number of, of, of great artists and musicians, you know, that played on Jefferson, and I display them all throughout this 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 museum, right. and uh, and I call these guys my artists, you know, <laughs> I, I, and I call them my artists because I represent their legacy. Right, right, you know, right. Uh, here on Jefferson Street, Hank Crawford, Hank Crawford is one of my one of my favorite uh, uh, artists to talk about. And Hank Crawford played saxophone for uh, uh, for Ray Charles, hmm. and Ray Charles has been in this house really? to come and pick up his saxophone player when they were getting ready to hit the road. So I've heard that from a couple of musicians. I didn't personally see him. I didn't personally see a lot of things because right. I was like 17, 18 years old, and I was just a kid over here. And but you had. Uh, other guys like um, uh, Jimi Hendrix and B.B. Uh, um, uh, King, you know, over here on Jefferson Street. But you had people like Frank Howard and um, Lucy Spoonman Tally. So you had a lot of uh, different musicians and artists over here on Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Street representing uh, this musical uh, scene. I call Jefferson Street the original music role. Mm. And the reason I call it the original music role instead of just Jefferson Street or music role because the music in Nashville started here on Jefferson Street. It spread it throughout. It didn't start on music row. Right. Music row was a part of the recording industry. Mm. They did recordings. Like studios. Like studios. Stuff like that, but no, no live performances like you would have here on Jefferson. Exactly. But Jefferson Street had live music, live performances. So it was a real musical role because you could hear music as you drove up and down Jefferson Street. It right. was music. Uh, where were some of the go-to spots musically in Nashville? I've heard of, you know, the Silver Street, Chitlin Circuit, but to your knowledge, where were some of the top places for people to visit for now, music? Now, when they come to Nashville, now the locals, now our, our main spot was the club Still Away and the New Era Club. Okay. And I've got some bricks over there from the New Era Club. They <laughs> tore the New Era Club down. I was passing by. He was able to grab and some. And I was able to grab some of the bricks. But I have not seen anybody else with bricks from the New Era Club. So, I mean, nobody. I mean, That's what makes it a museum, man, to have artifacts and, and history, stuff that a lot of people don't have their hands on. You know, right, for you to have right. it is a special thing to right. have. Um, speaking on Jimi Hendrix, so, you know, I was told that he was at the Del Morocco, which was a club, I'm guessing, back in the yeah, day, correct? it was. Okay, and that he played there. Right. And from my knowledge, he stayed not too far away from there for about a year or so? One door down. Okay. Uh, at this um, uh, Joyce's House of Beauty. It was a, a, a beauty, uh, it was a, a school, beauty school. Okay, for people to go get downstairs, their licenses and stuff. Yeah, gotcha. and upstairs, it was a boarding house. And in that boarding house, uh, Jimi Hendrix and uh, Billy Cox had a room upstairs in that boarding house. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Joyce Ackland, Uncle Teddy Ackland, who owned the Del Morocco, uh, I was at her house uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. And it was a, you know, a pleasure just to get a chance to holler at her again, because she saw the Duke Ellertons and the Ella Fitzgeralds, and, and she saw a lot of those folk when she was a little girl come into the, the the Del Morocco, right. and he, she said they used to pick her up because she was this cute little girl. Little girl. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So while Jimi Hendrix was staying there, was, was he staying there 
uh, primarily to perfect his craft, to be other around other musicians that were in the city, or he, what was, what was his purpose? Well, his much? purpose was to be around other musicians, and one thing Nashville had uh, back then was jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, you could get a job if you were a good musician, you could get a job in one of these clubs up and down Jefferson Street. Right. And uh, and they had places like boarding houses and rooming houses where like where stay Jimmy well. stayed. So it was cheaply, you could stay there and it wouldn't cost you an arm and leg. Right. And so it, it kept a lot of musicians here. Otis Redding, it kept him here for a while because everything was so convenient uh, for an up and coming musician. It's uh, hard to artist. beat a room and then be able to be other people be around other people, you know, that's in your that's profession as well, yeah. you yeah. know, and to have that also a community like Jefferson Street around people that you look like, you know, just to eat, drink, and be able to stay. So, you know, it's probably hard to pass to be moving to another city that won't have the same type of situation exactly. going on. Exactly. Um, so, so and, and the reason we're having this interview is because Nashville kind of get lost in history. When it comes to a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, but today we're focusing on music and, you know, with the with the term music city, you know, whether it's being downtown, people get the wrong perception of it. Right. You know, you right. don't really know Nashville. I tell a lot of people, Nashville has a lot of history. You don't really know until you go look. Right. You go look it up. You right. go research and you find out, man, Nashville had all this going on in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. You know, it's different than what you're taught. Um, so did you do you think Jefferson Street? Clubs and bars and all the musicians that came through helped get called Music City? People knew they can come well, here and actually the, just listen to music? Well, that by it being the musical city, and I say of the South, maybe not. Maybe it was Louisiana, <laughs> maybe it was Memphis, but you know. Every so. state going to brag about their own spot going on. Yeah. But, uh, but Nashville, uh, Music City, the name Music City arrived from the uh, Fist Jubilee Singers, when they went to uh, Europe to perform for Queen Victoria, okay. uh, uh, Queen Victoria couldn't actually remember the name of the Fist Jubilee Singers at the end, and she, she uh, and I, I'm referencing, and she said the mu the kids, these kids from the musical, uh, the Music City. Got to be from the Music City. Got to be from the singing. Music City. Right. And, uh, that's sort of how the, not verbatim, but sort of how the, the, the name, kinda name kinda got uh, stuck yeah, to Nashville it, with, with Music City. And uh, the Fisk Jubilee Singers, you know, uh, when Fisk was having a lot of problems with finances, Fisk Jubilee Singers went on road, uh, on the road, uh, singing all over Europe, you know, here, and it's even uh, uh, played at the White House a couple of times, <laughs> you know. And uh, these the, these singers, uh, young singers, made over one hundred and twenty thousand dollars back in seventeen. I mean, in eighteen uh, eighty eighteen sixty eight sixty nine somewhere in there. Uh, they made that much money in the eighteen hundreds. I'm not going to even try to think about what that is worth 1800s. now. Eighteen hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> they 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 made that much money, and then they came back, uh, and that's when they built Jubilee Hall was right after they came back off of that tour. And I think it was about a three-year tour mm. yeah, a that they time. did. Yeah. And, um, but they, they, uh, they saved the school. Mm. You know, the school was able to survive after they came, came back uh, to Nashville. With the funds and everything. Yeah. Um, in, your, in your opinion, what impact did African-American music on Jefferson Street have on Nashville? Well, um, by the time um, Jefferson Street uh, had started to decline, uh, uh, Night Train to Nashville was still on Jeff was still on TV, and Night Train to Nashville was the first black variety TV show uh, on TV in in Nashville, and uh, and most of these artists that played on that TV show, although Joe Text and B.B. Uh, King and, you know, uh, uh, Otis Redding, you know, a lot of these artists played uh, Night Train. And Night Train uh, uh, gave the, the local artists and musicians a chance to, uh, to show their talents on TV. And my man Herbert Hunter um, 
uh, uh, Mary and James, her, uh, her, her picture was on the cover of one of the two-part album that uh, Night Train, uh, that uh, Night Train, uh, uh, yeah, to Nashville did. And uh, uh, Frank Howard's picture was on the other one. Frank Howard and I grew up together in East Nashville. Mary and James uh, was a very, very good friend, and I helped take care of her the last couple of years of her life. So that was a personal interest. Uh, uh, Little Richard also played uh, Dead Night Train. And my best friend, I was telling you about Herbert Hunter, uh, he, did, he was on Night Train uh, at least every other week you know <laughs> showing us but stuff. yeah right. but they they did what they did everything that they could do to get on night train because that was the only black show in the city you know doing segregation right. that you could get on and 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 show your talents okay wow so i'm looking at your wall so you had little richard came through nashville yeah he played. stayed up the street really? uh, at the uh, uh the dale hotel there was a little hotel up the street where he stayed you know mm. BB King, that's all right, man. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this stuff I, you know, I would have never known. <clears throat> like I said, we heard of most of these artists, you know, Tina Turner, Will Richard, BB King, growing up, um, but never would have guessed they ever touched soil of Nashville. Oh, never yeah, performed. yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I said, this is history, man. So this is all right. Um, what were some of the top speakeasy clubs or nightclub joints in the fifty and fifties and sixties in Nashville? Well, you had the club still away. And this tree that I designed uh, really uh, gives you a, a good uh, uh, view of, of, of the clubs that was over here on Jefferson. Uh, you had um, um, the New Era Club. You had uh, the Black Diamond Club. The Black Diamond was sort of like a spillover club, okay. you know. Um, then you had... Uh, um, Price's Dinner Club. Price's was down there at 33rd near uh, Tennessee State. And they had a room in the back. It was a pretty nice sized room. It's where they played a lot of blues and jazz. And Marion James told me she named that room the Green Room. She was <laughs> proud of that. And uh, people like Fats Domino uh, okay. played in that room. But up front, in the front of the building is where the students could go and buy deli sandwiches, you know, cold drinks, and just kind of hang out. Right. So you had all of that music going on in the back, and a lot of them come just to be able to sit in there and listen, listen through the, the door, listen to that music through the door, you know. But uh, a lot of really uh, good musicians played in there. Gotcha. So the Jefferson Street Sound Tree basically lists all the clubs that were uh, alive. Some of them. Okay. Not gotcha. all of them, because oh. we had 20-something clubs on, uh, right. up and down Jefferson Street. Okay, so what's, what's, what's unique about the tree in your own What's words? unique about the tree, the limbs on the tree, well, you, the, the trunk of the tree is the center, mm -hmm. uh, and that represents Jefferson Street. The limbs on the tree represent the nightclubs that was on Jefferson Street, and the leaves on the tree represent the artists and musicians. That, uh, that, that played in these clubs. So now you can just look at that tree. You can see Jefferson Street, you can see the clubs, and you can see the people that played in the clubs all with one, in one sight. It's right there in front of you, bam. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, when and why did you create Jefferson Street Museum? Well, the reason I created the museum was so that I could uh, represent the artists and musicians that actually played on Jefferson Street and their legacies were being lost. And Marion James and Frank Howard, D. Ford Belly, a number of the older musicians, and most of them are gone now. Frank's still with us. But uh, they were afraid their legacy was going to be lost in the midst of gentrification. And it did, right. you know. And, it, and their legacy didn't start coming back alive until 10 years ago when I started the museum. Because nobody was talking about the music and the nightclubs. You, you know, you were in probably in college. Right. You know, were y'all talking about? Never. The so Del Morocco where Jimi Hendrix, I mean, where Little Richard played or 
uh, 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 Brown's Dinner Club. Were y'all talking about yeah, that? Never, then? not once can so, I remember. So that was a whole generation, just looking at your generation, that was a whole generation that didn't have any knowledge mm -hmm. of what I'm sharing here in this museum. Right. And it's kind of like their, their hard work and their craft, their talent kind of got lost in the times. Got lost. And now as time went on, the more and yeah. more people forgot about them. That's right. And if there's nobody else to remind you about them, then it'll just be completely faded off. Exactly. Musicians come every generation. Every generation. And they're just getting replaced by newer and newer right. musicians. And so, I mean, that's a good thing that you, you actually started this 10 years ago and you're holding on to it so people can kind of see what musicians I know what my parents may know mm -hmm. where they got their motivation yeah. from. Yeah. So I'm sure if you sit down with some of the artists that were in the seventies and eighties, they know the same people you're mentioning. Well I'll be eighty years old my next birthday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was here. All right. <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, that's good. Well we appreciate it. I'm sure the city of Nashville appreciate it. I'm sure the uh these musicians families appreciate it too to have a place for them to stop by. People that you know, even like myself, to be able to stop by and see, right, you know, right. it's one thing to hear about it, but to put you know rumors or or, or ideas to pictures, yeah, you know, yeah. like on this wall, we're gonna show this wall, you know, with you having the names, what they did, and pictures of how they look, it gives people more clear picture when you're talking about the individual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. And even you, you should have come in here and toured the museum before you did the interview. It's <laughs> <laughs> not going to be. We were sure going to do that before I leave. <laughs> but that's just, that's just the way it is. <laughs> right, you know? right, right, right. Like I say, I'm 80 years old, my birthday. And uh, I've had a chance to talk to many a young folk like yourself, right. you know, and to share this information uh, uh, with uh, your generation, generation before you, and, and, and some of the generation after you because I go to the schools mm -hmm. and I talk to the fourth graders and the fifth graders and the third graders, you know. I go to them with a story and, uh, and, and tell them a little bit, little bit about the history that came before them, right. you know. So uh, uh, this is one serious learning experience here in this building. Gotcha. Okay. On that note, sir, Mr. Washington, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we appreciate you being on my podcast. Once again, it's KB Talks Podcast. Thank you, our guest, Mr. Lorenzo Washington. And we'll be seeing you again for sure. I'll be back. For sure. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. Thank you. All right.